Dr. Pazio Poulos. Welcome to the show. How did I do? <laughs> Paziotopoulos. Oh, you know, we are, um, my wife is Greek. Uh, her family is um, from like the Thessaloniki area. Yeah. And uh, every year we go to Greece um, for the last 15 years. So we, we play this little game of trying to say Greek names. And uh, when you're in the Athens airport, there's an eyeglass store. And it's, it, it took us two trips to be able to say it. But it's uh, Dr. Papa Diamantopoulos. So I think I had that in my head when I tried to pronounce your name. But uh, I see why you call it the Pazio Center, because it's just easier. It's a lot easier. <laughs> Is that how you say it? Do you say the Pazio Center? Is that how you say it? Uh, we say Pazio Institute. Pazio uh, Institute. Okay. All right, cool. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to start off with um, your specialty, which is anti-aging. You received your fellowship in anti-aging and regenerative and functional medicine. Just for a working definition, how is anti-aging defined? So anti-aging has been around for a while, and I don't really define my practice as an anti-aging practice. Um, we use some of the anti-aging principles. But um, I went on and I did some more uh, work and I got a fellowship in stem cells and I also did some work in peptides. Um, and what I try to do also is I try to take all of this information and then use it using systems-based engineering principles so that we can apply all together. And over the last about four years, I've been at conferences that are um, focused on age reversal and working with those age reversal docs and getting on the age reversal net uh, panel of physicians. So doing age reversal is a little bit different than anti-aging. So what anti-aging was focused on was let's give you the right nutraceuticals or supplements. Um, let's replace your hormones. Let's try to get to the root of some of the disease problems and see if we can extend the quality of your life and the length of your life. The problem with that uh, methodology, and, and we still use that stuff, is that you can only extend life a certain amount. And you run into a blockade where maybe like 15, 20% lifespan, you're not gonna get past that. Um, and that's where age reversal came in. And so age reversal is like, well, let's see, like since there's diminishing returns with anti-aging, what if we just tried to reverse the age? And it's not really reversing. What it's doing is it's like, let's look at the things that are accumulating the damage and see if we can undo that damage so that you can live a longer life rather than trying to slow the progression of that damage down. And that's where the future is going. And that's what we're trying to do here. All right. So let's, let's go a little bit granular in that area. Are you familiar with a guy named Ray Kurzweil? Do you know that of name? Yeah. Of course. Okay. At that conference, one of the conferences I've spoke at before. Okay, cool. So I, I'm going to absolutely misquote him, but somewhere in my memory, somewhere down the road, I heard him, uh, somebody was asking him, why are you taking this many vitamins and this many nutraceuticals and blah, blah, blah. Um, he said, I'm just trying to get to the next decade because if I get to the next decade, I know there'll be a hockey stick growth and I can go another 30 or 40 years after that. And we're that close. So maybe you can let me know if you agree with that. And if you do, what is he really trying to say there? So Ray's got amazing theories, right? And you're talking about one of the smartest men that I've ever met. Um, and he runs Calico at Google. So that's their age reversal anti-aging division. And I didn't know Google had that. Yeah. And so he's focused on both trying to upload your consciousness into the cloud, you know, augmenting your brain with chips and other things so that you can have um, another cortex basically to your brain. So we have this prefrontal cortex that makes us different than all the other primates. And he wants us to have a cortex in the cloud, which then allows you to have pretty much superpowers, right? Um, so he's working both on the biological and on just, can you take the essence of who you are, your cognition and upload it into hardware? 
and then basically you'd be immortal and you could be downloaded into any body or whatever. Um, All right, so, so I, I feel has, like I just took an LSD trip. So, <laughs> so he's got some really crazy theories out there, but the, the idea is, and he's been really accurate about this on like the growth of technology. And so in the age reversal world, what we're trying to do is we're trying to repurpose medicines that we already have to work on the problems of aging. So one of the major problems that we focused on is senolytic cells. So these senolytic cells, I mean, they call them zombie cells, whatever they are, they were really important when you're being formed as a child, but they're not so important later. You need them like when you get damaged and you have to repair some tissue, but you don't need that many of them. And the problem is that the more they populate, so the, the more senolytic cells you have, the harder it is for your body to deal with them. So there's these really large cells and they release these enzymes that degrade things around them. And they also send out signals to other cells to turn them into senolytic cells. That's why we call them zombie cells. So when there, it gets to a point when there's too many of them, you can't live anymore. And as they populate, as they increase their population, they're increasing you know, on a logarithmic scale. So the older you get, the faster you get old. And everyone sees this because when you went from 20 to 30, you really didn't notice much. And how many 30 year old professional athletes are there? A ton, right? And a lot of them don't even peak until they're around 30. But how many 40 year old professional athletes are there? Not so many, right? And there's very, very few 50 year olds. And then everyone's seen someone that when they're around 70 years old, you know, near the end of their career, whatever it is, and they're still golfing and traveling and stuff like that. And then you see that person 10 years later when they're 80, and you're like, oh my God, this is not the same person, right? They're not nearly as mobile. They're starting to have some dementia signs, you know, losing their memory, you know, all this kind of stuff. And you're like, only 10 years went by. But that 10 years for the 70 year old was an, an incredible accumulation of damage. And it's from a lot of different factors, but senolytic cells are probably one of the most potent um, factors in the damage to that tissue. My God, there's so much that you said there. I don't even know which lane to go down. Um, so I just saw somebody recently that fell into that category where he was 60 and I didn't see him for almost a decade. And it looked like he gained 100 years, not gained, he aged 100 years in those 10 years. The accelerated yeah. growth. I almost thought he was sick, which he's not, but he just got old so fast and i even even seen it with my own dad so and i'm also experiencing and i'm 54 now and i'm starting to experience it myself where you know i'm i'm noticing that uh you know when i wake up in the morning i look at myself in the mirror i'm like who the fuck is that guy like i don't even i don't like i don't but the crazy part about it is i feel 16 but I, but I don't look 16 anymore. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. um, is there a way, and I guess we'll just bounce around like a real conversation here, but is there a way that you could, or, or maybe a better question would be, what are some of the things that you can do to identify those senolytic, uh, not identify, but to, uh, to work with those senolytic cells to stop that process that we're discussing? Sure. Um, so getting back to Ray Kurzweil and, you know, mm -hmm. his theory and it's, you know, kind of common theory among people doing age reversal is let's use what we have right now to buy you time. All we want to do is buy you as much time as possible because as the future comes, you know, four years ago, there wasn't age reversal. I mean, there was very, very few people dabbling in those types of medicines. But now there's a larger group of people and we have more data from, you know, the people that have been taking these medications and everything's been really positive. So as you buy yourself time by doing this stuff, in five years, we're going to have much better stuff. And the pharmaceutical companies right now have a lot of these drugs under research. And so those will be coming out you know, maybe 10 years from now, maybe less. Um, so what you want to do, if you're, a, if you're over the age of 50, you want to make sure that you find a doctor doing age reversal medicine. And age reversal medicine, there's really not a lot of us. And they're using senolytics 
They're also using repurposed uh, chemotherapy drugs to get rid of some of these cells. Um, they're using peptides. They're using this molecule called NAD, or, and they're you know, either trying to get your body to make more of NAD, or they're giving you the precursors for it. Um, and it goes down a whole list of all these metabolic pathways. And one of the ways that we can measure whether or not we're being effective, and it's not the only way to measure, but it's a, a newer way, is Dr. Horowitz came out with this thing called a biological clock. So you look at all these different metabolites and metabolites are just things that are molecules that are made in your body when they're broken down. And when you look at the uh, ratios of these metabolites to each other and how many of them there are, you can tell someone's biological age versus their chronological age. So, you know, somebody that's 50 years old might have a biological age of 40 and another person that's 50 years old might have a biological age of 60. And, you know, you can see that if you have the good genes to live a really long time and like all your grandparents lived to 100, well, you probably got those too, you know, and your biological age is going to be a lot younger than your chronological age. But the opposite happens too, where people come from families where, you know, everyone's kind of short lived. So you want to make sure that you can maximize that because we really do feel that maybe in the next 50 years or something, aging is going to be cured. And because it's just a process. Aging is a process of degeneration. And if we can fix how that, that degeneration happens, either repair it or prevent it or whatever we're going to do, um, you could live pretty much infinitely. And do you, what expectation do you have for your own personal life? You know, based on everything you know now, you've got access uh, to stuff that, you know, certainly – you've got access to the information, you've got access to the, uh, to the friends that can help you with this, et cetera. You know, knowing what you know, and I'm sure that you're, you know, you're drinking your own Kool-Aid now. So like, what, what, what do you see for yourself in terms of longevity? I mean, nobody really knows, but what I see for myself is if I can live another 50 years, which I think is, I think we have the technology right now, if nothing progressed, to get your average person that maybe has, you know, a genetic lifespan, you know, if they lived a normal kind of life, they didn't take supplements, they didn't do anything, maybe they're going to die at 80. Um, and if you're doing all this age reversal stuff right now and you're replacing your hormones and you're changing your lifestyle and all that stuff, you can probably live to 100. So if that's the case, in 50 years from now, I think that the technology is going to be there to double lifespan at least really and, so if you can um, make it let me make sure i understand that if you can make it to a hundred then you could probably get to 200 most is that, likely is that is that most accurate likely. and you need to have you know a backup plan and um one of, there's a backup plan that i give people i don't do it here and it has to do with cryonics so uh frogs can freeze solid and then they thaw out in the spring and everything's just fine. Some other animals can do that too. Um, but humans, not so much. Yeah. <laughs> but there's a company that was working on, uh, and there's a bunch of them now, and one of them is called Alcor. And if you were to die, they come to the hospital and they take your blood out and they change it out with biological antifreeze. And then they put you in the deep freeze. And before they had these kind of technologies, when you would freeze somebody, it would create these crystals and it would destroy the cell and it destroy the DNA and everything like that. And there's no way to put you back together after those fractures from these crystals form. Um, but now that's uh, diminished. And so they know how to freeze you and preserve you because once you're frozen and you're down, you know, minus 200 some degrees from liquid nitrogen, time stops for you. So you can be there for a million years preserved. And when they have the technology and the nanotech to rebuild you, to bring it back. Um, and, you know, we think about it as that's absolutely crazy, but all the advances in emergency medicine, they would be witchcraft if you went back 100 years ago. You know, right now we cool babies. Like you have a baby that has an anoxic injury from like swallowing the first pooper and it's called meconium, right? And, you know, they'd be like, oh, that baby's brain's going to be damaged. Well, now they just put that baby in the deep freeze, not that cold, but they put them cold. And so the inflammation is a lot less. 
There's also experiments doing that with people that have heart attacks and the damage is a lot less. Um, that was never there before. And even a simpler thing is somebody drops dead in front of you and you perform CPR on that person, that person comes back to life. You did that a hundred years ago. They'd be like, which, you know, or, <laughs> you know, whatever. And, uh, Oh my God, that guy kissed that, that man and brought him back to life. Let's burn him right? at the stake. So it's just kind of, you know, it's just the next evolution in emergency medicine. So and, that's effectively cr cryotherapy is what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's cryogenics, you know, like cryogenics. That's what I meant. Yeah. yeah okay. You down. Um, if you're young enough, you know, if I was like 20 years old, it'd be great because you can buy a life insurance policy for very, you know, inexpensive amounts per month and have that for your life. Now, if you're our age or above, you know, it's not going to be that cheap to buy that because we have less life, less life before we might need that. But there's nobody who's ever come out of a deep freeze, right? This is all just theoretical. Not yet. Not yet. So the, the problem is that if you get frozen, well, there's something that killed you. Right. And so we have to have the technology to repair that damage. Because if we had that, that technology, we wouldn't have to deep freeze you. God, this is so fascinating. Um, I want to yeah. touch on uh, putting your, um, your, your cortex in the cloud. What is your personal thoughts on that? Is it... I, I, you know, is it voodoo for you and you have no interest in it or is it, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm loving this. And, and, and I, I'd like to actually bring it into my practice someday. I mean, I think it's amazing to explore because what we're doing is we're really dissecting what is consciousness and what is an individual because uh, once they start doing stuff like that, we'll be able to see, well, how does it work? And what was missing from this person, right? What part of their personality is missing or how did it change or how, however it's going to evolve. And I think it's a really deep dive into our psyche and what makes us human. So I think it's worthwhile. I think most of the investigations into something that's never been done is fantastic. And, you know, calling something voodoo or just like saying, I'm not going to play a part of that. It's just like, well, that means that I don't want to know something about the universe. Yeah. So why would you want that? So you know, I, was, uh, I was listening to uh, Seinfeld's uh, new book. It's great. And one of the things he was talking about, he's a big uh, transcendental meditation guy. You wouldn't think he is, but he is. And he said, you know, there's a big difference between your brain and your mind. He said, my brain is like a schnauzer. I can like tell it, I can train it to do whatever the fuck I want to tell it to do. And it's just, it's gonna, it's gonna do it. If I say, you know, uh, I, last time I ran from here to the end of the block, it took me 10 seconds and I go run again. I can predict that I'm going to try and beat that time. It's like a schnauzer. I know what it's going to do. He said, but the mind's is a whole different thing. And I never heard it quite put that way. And I think that's sort of relevant to this sort of like cortex and the cloud thing, right? What, what are we actually putting into the cloud? All right. So let's take, let's take it down to earth a little bit um, from the cloud and let's talk about um, you're familiar. I'm sure you are with the blue zones. Yeah. Of course. Okay. So um, being a Greek, what is the name of the, uh, the Greek one that's number one? Icaria. Icaria. Okay, right. So uh, I've made it as far as Mykonos, uh, dancing on the tables with Uzo uh, and a lot of hangovers. Yeah. And I saw, I, long there. I saw, I saw Icaria <laughs> in the distance and I knew that that's where the, the people live the longest, that, but I never made it. Um, when I watch a documentary on Icaria, and I watch these guys that are 106 years old and he takes the walk to the bar has a, well, this was actually a, a mix between Icaria and Sardinia, right? So like the, the Sardinia one was the guy walks down, goes into the bar. He says, I go for a glass of wine at 12 and I go for another glass of wine at six o'clock. I've been doing it for the last 60 years and he's 106, right? What's going on there versus, well, that's, it's not a fair question. Is there anything that you can do to simulate or help people chemically, for lack of a better word, 
um, simulate some of the things that people are doing naturally within the blue zones. Like we know that people in the blue zones are, they're in community and they're spiritual and they're eating a Mediterranean diet and they're exercising and all of those things that make them live as long as they're living. Is there anything that you can do for people that are not living in Icaria and they're not living in Sardinia, they're living in Chicago and they got to figure out a way to live longer. What kinds of things can they do? Oh, they can do lots of things. I mean, the cool, the greatest thing about studying those places is we know a lot of the factors, the behavioral factors and the dietary factors, exercise factors, um, even sexual factors that allow those people to live longer um, outside of the genetic pool that they also have, right? So um, one is in the diet, it's not just Mediterranean diet because there's blue zones outside of the Mediterranean. Uh, one of the things that we find in the blue zones is that they eat a low protein, high plant-based diet. And um, in our world, especially in athletes, um, everyone thinks that they need to take copious amounts of protein. Um, I have plenty of athletes that are plant-based that are on moderate amounts of protein and they have fantastic output. So I, I think that you don't need all that protein and that protein helps you age faster. So you just want to have the protein that you need to goodbye if you're a high level athlete and you're really pushing it hard well it's kind of like burning the candle at both ends right you're going to burn bright but you're not going to burn long so you want to have a moderate amount of exercise not a, a, a type of exercise that's going to put you at uh, elite class you just can't stay there that long it's too hard so we want to have moderate exercise low protein intake high plants and you really want those high plants because the plants are gonna give you the microbiome in your gut that's gonna fight inflammation and keep chronic inflammation low. And that high fiber is gonna really help you to, to feed them and to keep um, colon cancer at a low risk. So that, those are the big things from their diet. The other thing is they usually eat lots of fermented foods, whether, whether wherever blue zone you're looking at. You know, the, the Greeks, they ferment their yogurts and the Okinawans, they, you know, they have miso and other things like that. So the fermented foods. Um, and you can overdo it on that stuff too, right? So you got to be in moderation. And then they're sexually active and they are in community and being in community is great. And being supported by your, your tribe is super important. And so finding groups to be with, and it's hard in COVID to do that now, but um, when you, when you have groups that you get together and some people, their group is their church or some people, their group is their yoga studio. Um, you know, I have a, a bunch of uh, clients that are acro yogis and they have a great group, you know, and they're like all acrobats and stuff like that. So having a group or a tribe to be with, it just gives you that sense of community and belonging and that somebody else wants to help you that you're not alone. And, they don't want anything in return. So I think that that's super important to have in your life. And everyone has access to something like that. You just have to be proactive to go find it. Um, people are very welcoming when it comes to entering a group. You just have to enter. One of the blue zones is in right here near LA, um, Loma Linda, California. Are you familiar with that one? I don't know that one. So it's really interesting. Um, they are, I think, number three. I think they're just outside of Okinawa in terms of longevity. And I live in L.A. and there's a lot of Kentucky Fried Chicken here. I'm trying to figure out what the hell's going on. And then somebody educated me on this. It's the highest concentration of Seventh-day Adventists in uh, the United States. And they don't... Um, they don't take drugs. They don't do caffeine. They have communities and they, they meet. It's this weird pocket in L.A. that meet all of the blue zone criteria um, and they're living really, really long. So, okay. A couple of things that you said um, that really struck me and uh, all right, I'm going to go down this road next. A lot of people who listen to this show are looking at 
let, let's call it like anti-aging play school 101. Like it's the basic stuff, right? It's the, okay. it's the hormone replacement therapy. That's the sure. big one that I get. I get messages all the time. So for years, um, I thought, well, why would I want to replace my hormones? Because there's going to be some negative effects that um, I'm going to get if I do that. And I listened to a Joe Rogan podcast and for whatever the reason, I don't know why, but, but, but Joe, like he tells me to jump off a bridge. I'm going to do it. The guy just, I just, I'm buying whatever he's selling. And he said, look guys, if you want to feel better, then take testosterone. If you don't want to feel better, don't take it. It's as simple as that. And I don't know what it was, but I just, I marched my ass into the local place. And, you know, the, the doc said, you probably won't feel much for, you know, um, a couple of weeks, maybe a month, two months, but it, it'll hit you. My, my levels were um, 350. Um, and okay. he said, well, <clears throat> you want to get to a thousand? I'm like, what's a thousand? He said, you were probably there when you were 20. And I was like, fuck it, let's do it. That was probably a year ago. I will hunt you down for that testosterone now. I will, like, it, it, like there is no, I would rather go without food than not getting that testosterone. Now, my wife is walking around like Bambi on ice. I mean, like, she's going like, dude, you got to back off. Like, this is crazy. But it has changed my whole life, my level of energy, how my body is functioning, et cetera. So, is there any side effects to doing things like we're discussing now? Let's take the example of testosterone. What's the trade-off on the downside to doing it? I mean, there's really not much of a, tra a trade-off. Um, it's how you want to do it. So testosterone therapy can be done in pretty much four different ways, mostly. Um, and most of them I don't use because of the side effects. Okay. Never want to take testosterone orally. <clears throat> And it's because of the way it gets broken down in the liver and the metabolites. Okay. Um, a lot of men are given testosterone in a cream or a gel. The problem with that is underneath your skin is fatty layer. And in that fatty layer, um, those cells have an enzyme. And that enzyme is called aromatase. And aromatase will turn that testosterone into estrogen. So most of the men that I've seen that came in from some other provider on a testosterone cream, one, they didn't really have the maximum benefit from the testosterone replacement, and two, their estrogen levels were very high. And we want to keep that, that ratio at the proper level. The other thing that you notice is I measure how estrogen is broken down in the body and what metabolites are made from that. Because if you go down the wrong pathway, you're headed towards cancer, if you're on the right pathway, it's a protective pathway. But until you measure that, you don't know. And I find that whether you're on injections or whether you're on, and which are better than the topicals, but even the injections tend to move you towards the wrong pathway. Um, people that are on injections are usually injecting twice a week. Um, there's new testosterone uh, formulations where they put a medicine called anastrozole, which blocks that conversion of that enzyme so that you're not converting your testosterone into estrogen. And you can inject that at the same time. I like that a lot better than the old school way was to inject testosterone and take anastrozole orally. Because I don't want to have anastrozole hitting my liver and hitting my whole body. I just wanted to block it at that site where most of that conversion is happening. And the best way I like to do testosterone is pellet form. Just think of little Tic Tacs and it's put under the fat around your hip. And we do that somewhere around every 100 days. And the reason I like that a lot is when you're on injections, you're going to get a peak and then a trough and then a peak and then a trough of testosterone every few days. It, and testosterone receptors are mostly in your brain. So what you're going to do is you're going to get changes in mood and you're going to get changes in, you know, uh, a lot of times you're going, to get, you're going to be short fused. Whereas when you're on a pellet, you're going to get a peak and a trough, but it's over that longer period of time, it'll be over maybe like 150 days or so. And then when you get on a schedule, you're putting a pellet every 100 days, instead of doing this, you're just going to be like this nice wave. And you're not going to notice these changes in testosterone because it'd be so slight. And having an astrozole as a pellet placed with that testosterone 
I'm able to manage um, the estrogen at just the right level. And I can manage people's testosterone very, very accurately. Whereas, you know, you're pulling the same amount in the syringe, um, but injecting it over so many times, you're going to get scar tissue and stuff like that. And it's not like you're not going to get any with the pellets, but you're switching hip, hip to hip. So um, I really like the pellets better. But as far as complete downsides from testosterone, there's very few. The only way is like if you give too much. So like the doctor was saying, like you're about a thousand when you're a 20 year old, right? You know, and you know, the numbers vary from person to person, but that's kind of like the level you want to be. We find that there's a shrinking of the brain and the bones and the muscle when you start to get below um, 600 and it starts to be rapid. And if you look at MRIs or CT scans of people's brains as they age, it just keeps shrinking. And since most of your testosterone receptors are in your brain and testosterone is a steroid hormone, so it makes you grow, right? So it keeps your bones strong, keeps your muscles from wasting, keeps your brain from wasting. It's a super important medicine. But I think the only time that it's not good is if you were to get um, a cancer where testosterone makes that cancer grow. Uh, those are very, very rare. Um, so, um, in the instance of women, I give women lots of testosterone pellets. And you can look on uh, Dr. Rebecca Glazier's site, um, hormonetherapy.org, and she has all this open source data there. And she's been using testosterone with anastrozole with women that had estrogen positive breast cancers, and they had incredible outcomes without chemotherapy. Um, and, you know, when you put women on testosterone, I think they like it better than the men do they say like, oh, my headaches are gone and my brain fog is gone and my memory's back and I have self-confidence in myself. Um, and then, you know, their body shape starts to change. They start to add a little muscle and they start getting rid of their fat. So um, I think testosterone is fantastic. And, you know, American <laughs> Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine has been around, what, 28 years now? And so we have a lot of data on bioidentical hormones because it's been done for so long. And when you look at the people that have been on bioidenticals managed by, you know, a functional medicine doctor versus their peers, you can't compare the people. They're just such a, a higher quality of, of lifestyle. So, yeah, for sure. I, I, I noticed the, uh, the big difference. The other thing I noticed too, is I started tracking um, things like sleep with my whoop. Um, and, um, I was getting 15 minutes of sleep prior to testosterone. That was it. And I was like, everybody around me, a lot of my friends are younger than me. And, and I was like, how much are you getting? How much are you getting? And everybody's getting like about an hour. And I was like, shit, I can't get, I changed everything. I did blackout curtains and I did earplugs and I got a chili pad and I, I architect, you know, I completely architected the whole room. No change. Testosterone within two months, I went from 15 minutes to two hours of deep, slow wave, deep sleep. It's never happened before. So, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm loving it. Um, you mentioned scar tissue with the injections. How much of a, an issue is that? Does it create, if you get injected regularly, does it create like piriformis syndrome or that kind of thing? Or it depends where you're injecting, how fast you're injecting, what size needle you're using, um, all of that stuff. Uh, the, the rule of thumb is that you're supposed to inject intramuscularly. Yeah. And they're not supposed to inject sub Q or yeah. sub Q which is short, right? Because you can get some problems there. I've never really seen those problems in people that are injecting sub Q. Okay. Uh, so, and the newer formulation from some of the compounding pharmacies is that they're putting the testosterone into MCT oil instead of using some of the thicker oils that they're using before. So, the older injections, you know, if you're getting the standard stuff, you have to use a fairly thick needle to pull it through. You notice how thick that stuff is. Yeah. And then when you inject it, you have to use a fairly larger needle. But now using MCT oil, you can get to using a 27 gauge needle, which is really thin. And then I don't, I don't tell people to inject very deep. And so you're going to get a lot less problems with it. And those are just the people they not everybody wants to do pellets or, you know, they can't come into Chicago that often. So um, I do have some people on injections, but I manage them really closely and I don't let their levels go too high. Um, one of the things that physicians will do and they'll have someone do an injection and then they'll measure their testosterone like, I don't know, four or five days after. 
And it's like, oh, you're at 900 or 1,000. You're great. It's like, no, you're not. <laughs> right? You're at 900 or 1,000 five days after an injection. So you are probably well over 2,000 after you're injected. Whereas when you're on pellets, you're just on that same amount most of the entire time you're on that pellet. If they're on injection, so how do you get an accurate level of where they are? Do you so do it a week later? I'll do or? it two days after an injection. I'll have them do it. I'll have them do that, those injections twice a week. Um, and then I'll get, inject, I'll get levels at different days so I know what their peaks are and what their troughs are. Mm. So, you know, you want to know, like, what do they get? What are they the next day? And what are they the morning before they would normally inject? Got it. Um, I, it's a little different. Yeah, for sure. We're all, we're all unique. <clears throat> um, you also do peptide. Is testosterone considered a peptide? No, testosterone's a steroid hormone. Steroid hormone. Okay. So you also do peptides. Um, and, um, I just tried something, uh, myself called BPC one five seven. Are you familiar with that one? Yeah. Body protection complex one fifty seven. It's made okay. from lips to anus. Okay. Made from lips to, what does that mean? I'm not sure I understand. So, that. Basically your digestive tract makes BPC one fifty seven. Um, oh. it, it, it makes you heal fast. So you ever notice like cut your arm, and it takes a long time to heal, right? Yep. Bite your cheek really hard and you're bleeding and you wake up the next morning and you're pretty much healed. Yep. That's BPC 157 at work. Okay. So th the reason why I got on this is because a lot of people who listen to the show were asking me, hey, have you tried BP? And I, I look for trends. Like what are the things that people keep emailing me about? Sure. So um, BPC-157, is that something you do in your practice and who do you recommend it for? Regularly. Um, probably the people I recommend it to the most for are people with um, autoimmune gut disorders, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease. Um, they can take that orally and they can boost their BPC-157 and their digestive tract, allowing them to heal faster from their, the injuries that they're occurring. They love it. They feel so much better on it. And whether on immune suppression, not on immune suppression, whatever it is, they feel a lot better. The other times I do it is uh, anyone that has an injury. So a lot of times people have a rotator cuff injury and, you know, they're like, should I go get surgery? You know, should I do this? I'm going to go to PT and um, I'll do a combination of that BPC-157 with another peptide called Thymosin Beta-4 which stimulates the immune system to go help you fix things as far as tissue repair. Cause your immune system does tissue repair. It also does like fighting uh, diseases, you know, uh, pathogens, things like that. Uh, Thymosin beta four with the BPC 157 works fantastic. Now it's not going to heal you from like a completely torn rotator cuff or something like that. But if you have some tendonitis or you have a slight labral tear or something like that, and you do those injections and you do the exercises, you're much more likely to, to fix yourself than without it. Same thing with other soft tissue injuries. Can you stay on it or do you need to cycle off it? I mean, you can stay on it, but it's like the body, has, you know, anything you stay on long term, there's going to be a feedback loop problem, right? Even like with testosterone, I never just give somebody to sip testosterone and the anastrozole. So what I'll do is I put them on different peptides so that they keep this feedback loop between their brain and their testes active. So if you're on testosterone, there's two markers that your physician's probably getting, and it's LH and FSH. Yep. The luteinizing hormone comes from your brain, tells your testes to make testosterone. FSH tells your testes to make sperm. Those go to zero. And so this whole feedback loop stops and we don't know really everything else that's connected to that feedback loop. So using medicines like enclomiphene or kispeptin or uh, HCG or gonadarel and things like that, they keep that feedback loop going. And I'm always cycling those things. And by doing that, you don't get any loss of testicular volume. And you keep LH and FSH on the board. Um, if you just stay on your testosterone long term, you would notice your testicles would just start getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, okay. And I, we don't know all this stuff with the peptides yet because they haven't been out long enough. Right now, I don't think that there's really that much of a feedback loop with BPC-157, but I like to cycle things. Um, they just tend to work better when you cycle them on and off.
So like a month on, month on, month off, or like... Yeah, it just depends how bad the injury is, right? So if you're like dealing with a really bad injury, maybe I'll keep you on for three months, but then I'll stop it. Well, I don't really have a particular injury. I just have that like I'm, I'm old and I wake up in the morning and everything hurts injury. <laughs> so that's why I start to take it. Is that, am I, am I looking at this the wrong way? No, I mean, you, it, it's really safe, right? So that's the really great thing about peptides is... Um, I think there's over 4,000 something peptides that have been identified. So all a peptide is, is a, sh- a chain of amino acids, just like a protein is, except it's, and there's different definitions, but less than 50 amino acids is kind of like a rule of thumb put together. This is a short peptide sequence. So that's peptide sequence can turn things on and turn things off in your cells. Okay. And they're already made in your body. So it means that you already have a metabolism for that. So your body knows, it recognizes it, it knows what to do with it, and it knows how to get it out of the body. So it's not like when you have a pharmaceutical drug that's been made, because by definition, if you get a patent on a pharmaceutical, well, it can't occur in nature. So now you're getting, it's called a xenoparticle. You're getting something that your body's not seen before which you can usually deal with because it has really cool liver enzymes. Um, but you don't really know what it's going to bind to. You don't know how it's going to be metabolized and what are the long-term effects of it. But since these peptides already occur, they're fairly safe. Okay. Um, we talked a lot about things that you do there. And I know that one of the things that you guys are known for there is, is sort of treating the whole body and not just, you know, one area, which I, which I love. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about, I'm going to call it an executive physical because I don't know what else to call it, but I had an interesting experience where a friend of mine, um, I saw his dad and he was like 70 something. And uh, he was great. And then literally two days later, he dropped dead. Um, and um, they, they referred to what happened to him as the widow maker. It was, you know, this ultimate, there were multiple ventricles or something that was blocked in his, his heart. You, you'd understand that term better than me. What can we do? I, I know there's no crystal ball and I know we can't see into the future and we can't possibly predict every scenario that's going to happen to us. But since you treat the whole body, what should we be looking at in the way of scans? I'm calling it scans. You can use whatever word you want um, to evaluate the brain, to evaluate all the possible things that can cause a, a widow maker. Like I just described, like, what do you do proactively to look for things that you have no symptoms for? You just want to live a longer, healthier, healthier life. Sure. That's a great question. So um, it's kind of the foundation of what we're doing. Um, look at, and I just use this example a lot because everyone knows about it. Um, the airline industry and they have their problems, but their safety records incredible. Mm. Now think about how difficult a problem it is to keep all of those airplanes maintained to that level. So if you have a 30 year old airplane, it has to meet basically the same specs as a brand new one. So how's that possible? And the only way it's possible is through systems based engineering or industrial engineering, however, you know, or mechanic or maintenance engineering, how you look at it. And it's basically what they do is they do this thing called the discovery process and they have all of their processes in line. So they're going to say, okay, what fails when, right? So they're like, usually a fuselage is going to have a, a, a compromise at this time after this many flights, you know, an engine is going to have a problem usually after this many hours, right? That hydraulic system can last this long. So what they do is they make sure that it's maintained properly and it's checked on a regular basis and well before that that thing's going to fail, that part, it's going to be replaced. And all of that goes into those airplanes. That process of system-based engineering is how you maintain anything that's a complex machine or anything that's a complex system, like in a business or something. That's not being utilized to help you. Right. That's, that engineering uh, idea, ideology is over 100 years old. But when you go to your physicians, they're problem-based and they're taught to be problem-based from medical school and residency, right? What, what is the problem and what's my plan? 
for that problem. If engineers were always like reacting to problems, we'd all be dead. Right. Oh, wow. There was a problem with that bridge. Oh, well, there better not be. <laughs> or there's a problem with that airplane. No, we can't, we, that can't be afforded, but with your own life, the most precious thing on the planet, that's not being used. So we're trying to use systems-based engineering here. And part of that is looking out for what's going to happen to you. And cardiovascular disease is rampant in, in our country. And it's, you know, mo a lot of people are going to die from heart attacks. What's being done to make sure that you don't have a heart attack? They're measuring cholesterol. Well, we know that half the people that come to the emergency room for a heart attack have normal cholesterol and are on a statin medication. So that doesn't work, right? It's not that it's not reducing it, right? It is reducing it. And those things are, are beneficial in some respect, but it's not fixing it. It's not, it's not keeping people from dying from heart attacks. There's a pretty simple test. It's called a pulse test, P-U-L-S. And it's looking at inflammatory markers. And it gives you a five-year risk for having uh, a cardiovascular incident. The other thing that we can do is we can do what's called a CT calcium score for your heart. So there's a process called dystrophic calcifications. And it's when calcium starts depositing into tissue. And we can see that on a CT scan. And when we see a lot of calcium that's been deposited in the coronary arteries, one of them is that LAD or the Widowmaker that your friend's dad died from, right? You can say, okay, this person has a high chance or is at a high risk based on that score. The other thing you can do is you can do carotid artery um, ultrasounds and you can look at the carotid artery because the carotid artery, it goes here and then it branches into two. And so there's a lot of turbulence there. And so that's a place for plaque to build up. So by looking here, we can see soft plaques. And by looking at the heart, we can see what's called hard plaques. And it's not perfect. It's not like doing an angiogram where you're putting dye through, but you can get a pretty good idea of whether this person's a high risk or a low risk. And so you have all the cholesterol and the cholesterol particle numbers, and things like lipoprotein little a and these other markers that show whether or not you're creating plaques. You have these scans and you have the pulse test looking for inflammation. So now we have a pretty good idea of what risk is this person at? And then we know what steps to take to prevent that from um, taking that person's life. And that's just so, one example. So, 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 just, so how do you, where do you go for that? Who's the guy that does all of that? People like or, me. Okay, so you do that. You do all of that. Yeah, and we, I don't have all that at the facility, but I can order that, and you can go to a radiology department or you can go somewhere else and get those scans done. Those scans are not expensive. Um, there's plenty of hospitals where you can go in, you have the order from the physician to do a CT calcium score and a carotid artery, and it's like 200 bucks out of pocket. Okay, so just to make sure that I'm tracking – if somebody listening to the show says, hey, you know, I, 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 I'm healthy, I feel good, but I, I want to make sure I stay that way. And I, I, I'm buying into this, you know, sort of like systems based engineering that makes sense to me. Uh, you know, why would I want to wait till there's a problem with the bridge and the car falls through the middle of it? Let's make right. sure that it's engineered properly and replace the fusel fuselage when it's supposed to be replaced, even if it isn't broken. Right. Because we know it's going to break. And they say, okay, I want to fly down there and I, I want to meet with the doc and I'll have him do it. Is, is there something that they should ask for when they come in? I'm using the word executive physical because it's the only word that I've heard. Is there something that you do that, is there a package that you have that's, that you, you get the idea? Yeah. So we have to do things in packages because unfortunately this is expensive medicine. Yep. Right. And so I want to do medical engineering for everyone, but not everyone has the funds that they can do everything. Okay. So we have it tiered, And the, at, in the beginning, we weren't really be able to help people at the lower level income, you know? And now what we've done is we've created a lower level package because the labs that we can get and just the assessment that we can do for like a, a one-time consultation with a battery of labs can save somebody's life and yep. can help them live a longer life just with basics. Okay. And then somebody that says is, is fairly wealthy and if they're you know, older in age and they really want to buy as much time as possible, well then we dive in and we can go full base systems-based engineering 
you know, and get you know, neurological scans and we can get functional tests on your cognitive abilities and your memory and go through all your cardiovascular system, go through all the systems, get you on age reversal, get you on hormone replacement, use peptides, you know, custom supplement packs, everything. Okay. So just for ballpark ranges, entry level and whole enchilada, what are we, what are we talking roughly? Entry level, you know, you get your labs done and depending on whether or not your insurance is going to cover those, we kind of give you a, a ballpark of whether or not you're going to get covered or whether you get cash labs. We had incredibly good pricing yep. on cash labs. So if you came in, you got cash labs, you did a consult and you got some, you know, real basics, you're looking at about a grand. Okay. And that would just give you a nice idea of where you're at and what your risk is at. And then you okay. can do whatever you want from there. If you wanted to go full blown, I want to do full age reversal. I want all the IVs because we have yep. IVs that can help pull calcium out of your arteries. We have IVs that can replenish your NAD levels, all that kind of stuff. They go full in. I mean, someone could go all the way up to like maybe 50 grand for a year. Got you know, it. kind of like the middle of the road is probably like 25 where you're getting most of the benefit of some anti-aging you're getting some of the age reversal stuff. You're getting really deep and in, in-depth, you know, systems-based engineering. And, you know, that's kind of where most of the people will fall that have the ability to do that. And it's, you want to be able to do that every year. Cause it's not like you can just do this for one year. And it's going to have long-term benefits. Right. Right. You have to be able to keep it up. And that's where we speak with someone. It's like, as long as you can afford whatever it is you can afford per year and it doesn't increase the stress in your life, it's going to be a great benefit. Mm. But one of the things that we also look at, and it's a really major variable is, and there's not really another way to look at it is spirit. So, you know, someone with a really powerful spirit, all kinds of stuff can go wrong in their life, but they're untouched. They're calm and their breathing isn't affected and they stay in real time and they just do what they can. And someone with a heart, their spirit's not strong. When all these stressors hit them, they fall apart and they're not able to function correctly. And all their stress hormones go through the roof and all this stuff. So a person that's not in stress and we call that person in a state of what's called coherence. And we measure coherence in the clinic by hooking up to biofeedback equipment. And we find that, even somebody that's like, oh, yeah, I have a meditation practice or I've been practicing yoga for 20 years. When you hook them up, they're not in coherence. You take some Buddhist monk that's been in the monastery for 20 years, they're always in coherence. Right. So there's something that's getting lost with our practices and that we're not transferring those practices into our daily lives. But when the people learn how to get into coherence and they practice it on a regular basis, now they're strengthening their spirit and they're strengthening their resistance and when they're in that state of coherence, they're no longer in that sympathetic flight or flight. They're in that rest and relaxation. So is this I think like, that, it, 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 sorry, is, is this like heart math Institute stuff? Exactly. Like that kind of? Heart math stuff is right on. And there's a step above heart math is, which is what we do in the clinic. Um, we have a provider, her name's Dr. Eugenie Pabst, and she'll hook you up with more, more detailed equipment than you do with the heart math. And she can show you on the screen, you know, your, uh, whether or not you're breathing and your heart rate's in coherence, you should go to your fingertips and what, you know, how you're, the heat in your hands and the conductivity in your skin. I mean, it just goes to next levels. And measure HRV and things like that. All that. And, you know, and everyone really should get like an aura ring or a whoop so they can see what's happening to them on a daily basis and, you know, kind of look at it. It's like, oh yeah, I had a couple of glasses of wine before I went to bed the other day. Well, what happened to your heart rate variability? Oh, it's some, I, I got it down. I can do, I can do two and it right. almost has no effect as long as I do it by 7 PM. I go to sleep at 10, 10 30. Yeah. If I do it by seven and the second glass is done, almost no effect. If I do the third, it's like I was on a bender for a month. It's crazy. It's just how my body works. And if I don't do wine, if I do like a margarita one or two, it's through the floor, my HRV, and it's screwed for three or four days. It's crazy how much alcohol um, affects things like HRV. Have you heard of Newcom? No, what's Newcom? It's really interesting. I think, you'd, I think you would really enjoy it. Uh, it was a guy on um, 
uh, Tim Ferriss or Joe Rogan. I can't recall right now. Um, but quickly, he was talking about binaural beats. And he was saying that um, when you listen to binaural beats, it'll put you, it'll help you move more towards theta. Tony Robbins, it was on a Tony Robbins podcast. Tony uses it. Um, it'll put you more into like a, a theta state. He said the average iTunes song or YouTube song that you're listening to has about seven megabytes of information. We figured out how to do 700 megabytes of information. And if you try and download the track, it takes forever because it's so big. Um, and I just got on it last week where you take a, a GABA patch and you put it on your wrist, put um, some, uh, uh, a mask on your face just to block the light out. Um, and you just listen to this track with your regular uh, earbuds. I don't know what is in this shit, but within three minutes I was drooling in the corner. Like just, I couldn't lift my arms. I couldn't move my body. I have never felt anything like this within 15 or 20 minutes. My, and then I was like, I gave it to my wife. I said, just tell me what happens. And she came up, she goes, what is in this? And so this is right up your alley. Google it. You will, you'll love it. So I checked it out. Um, so what we do here in the clinic, um, and I'm not saying that this isn't beneficial, but um, we have a, a, an affiliate and his name's Dr. Sam Afra. And he'll put a cap on your head and fill it with uh, gel. And there's 24 leads on your brain. And then he'll measure with your eyes open and your eyes closed. And he gets a picture, and it's called a QEG, of your brain. And you can see whether or not your brain is in that state of coherence, which of the waves are dominant in which places, and how the brain's communicating with itself. Mm. And you want to do that, and then you want to compare that to, you know, databases of quote-unquote normal brains. And then you train your brain away from the extremes. And that'll balance you out a little bit better. When you have kind of a generic thing and, you know, theta waves put you in this kind of dream state. Um, and that's not what most people need. Most people need to like lower their high beta and raise their alpha. And so that they're more alert, focused, and present. You don't want to be drugged up. Right. 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 You, want to be like, you want to be that Kung Fu master that's present at all times, ready for anything, listening, being aware, right? You don't want to be out of it. And so you want to balance your brain and get yourself into coherence. That'll never be done by a regular, you know, one, one size fits all because everyone's brain's a little bit different. Yeah. So that's where we usually push people. And when they go through neuro, neurofeedback training, they get better. Their IQ goes up their attention gets a lot better, right? They feel better, their, their executive functions get better. So all of it, um, slapping a GABA patch on you, like if you just did that by itself without the rest of it, you'd still feel like, like most of that that you felt. And that's throwing a, uh, an imbalance into your, into your neurotransmitters, mm. right? So what your body's gonna do is like, oh, well, I, there's all this GABA here right now, so I need to break that GABA down. So after you break all that GABA down and you're not getting any more GABA, guess what happens? There's less GABA circulating. Right? So every time you're messing around with the feedback loop, you're going to have a long-term effect. All right. So I'm going to have to leave it to the professionals. Um, I'm not right. saying anything against this. You know, I mean, they probably have their studies and it's probably beneficial for a lot of people. You know, yeah. I don't want to say anything negative about something that's just my gut reaction to that you yeah, know no, no it makes it makes perfect sense it's there is no one size fits all because there's no one brain fits all all right so with the remaining time because i could literally talk to you for days you're fascinating um i'm going to switch gears a little bit and i want to move into just a few sort of like maybe rapid fire e kind of questions what do people often get wrong about you or the kind of work that you do I think the number one thing that people get wrong is that they're going to look younger, mm. right? That this is an aesthetic kind of thing. Like, oh, you're doing age reversal. You're trying to make everybody look younger, you know, and stuff like that. And it's totally not what we're focused on. I Got think, it. You know, but um, we're trying to make it so that we're going to make you live longer and less likelihood of having a degenerative disease or dementia or a cancer or something like that. To me, that's far more important. 
For sure. Um, what is the one rule that you have for yourself that you'll never break? Uh, I'll, I'm a vegan. I've been a vegan since 1997. Wow. Um, I'll never break that. Um, I have a yoga practice. I'll never break that. Interesting. Um, what's the one goal that you thought, you know, when I achieve this thing, like my life is going to be great. And then I got it. And I was like, Ugh, that just didn't do it for me. What was that thing that came up for, that comes up for you? Um, probably getting my MD. <laughs> <laughs> I could, I get that. If you um, could, that's perfect. That's perfect. If you could spend one month anywhere in the world, where would it be and why? Uh, how long in there? How long did you say? One month. One month anywhere in the world, I would go back to the island that my grandfather was born on in Greece. Which, which was? Catalonia. Uh, is that T-H or K? Um, they, they, they spell it sometimes with a C or a K. Okay, because um, I've seen Kefalonia. Yeah, so it's the largest of the Ionian Islands. It's just on the way, it's between Italy and Greece, right? And yeah. there's those the major, major islands, and they look totally different than the Aegean Islands. They're mountainous, they're filled with forests, they have crazy, amazing beaches, and uh, that's where the Odyssey was. It was over on that side. You know, it's so funny with, uh, with, I have, because we've been going to the same hotel for 15 years, my, uh, we're now friends with the family that owns it. And it's literally like my big fat Greek wedding. Like every time I'm there, I'll say anything. I'll say pencil. And he say, you know, the word pencil comes from the Greek word. <laughs> you got like, you got to love them. Um, okay. Do you, uh, just a couple more questions. Do you collect anything or have you ever collected anything? Um, I did collect when I was younger. You did? What'd you um, collect? So, uh, I used to take my money. I used to cut lawns. Uh huh. Right. And it was great money. I mean, like, I had so it's much unbelievable. money. unbelievable. The right? old man, the, the old man doesn't want to cut his own lawn. I get it. Right. I had like eight <laughs> lawns in grammar school and high school, like 20 bucks a piece and put your old Walkman on and with a nice mixtape and just go. That's um, great. Oh my God. You're bringing me back now. <laughs> what, uh, what, um, so book? I would, I would collect comics. Comics, okay. Yeah, okay. and uh, I was really into that, and so I have all my comics in like boards and bags and preserved and things like you that. You still have them? I still have them, and um, you know the Black Panther movie when it came out like a couple yeah. of years ago, right? Yeah. I'm like, I think I have the first Black Panther, and I'm like, yeah, I do. I have uh, Fantastic Four number fifty two, and it's the wow. first appearance of Black Panther. And then I went, I'm like, I wonder how much this is worth, and I was like, oh my god, <laughs> right? And it's just like just sitting in my closet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the kind of work you're doing now is sort of like, we, you know, we could do a whole therapy session on how the, the comic books have aligned with the kind of work you're doing now. I mean, it's, it's there's some truth there, I'm sure. Oh, for sure. Um, <clears throat> what book have you reread or re-listened to the most? Huh. I read a lot. Um, there's a book by uh, Richard Freeman, who's a yogi mm -hmm. in uh, Boulder, Colorado. Um, he uh, I studied under him for a few years while I lived out there. Yeah. I wrote a book called The Mirror of Yoga. And if you don't have time to go read all these ancient texts and then to try to understand them in today's world, I would read Mirror of Yoga. I think it helps everyone kind of understand what yoga is and how it can help you. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really deep understanding of it. Um, I think I, I can reread it again and again, and I always get something new out of it. That's great. All right. Two questions. Um, last one is what is their second to last is what's your guilty pleasure? Huh. What's my guilty pleasure? I love dark chocolate. Dark chocolate. <laughs> that, that's number. That's the most popular. It's number two for people. You know what number one is? Uh -uh. Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> I don't and, know. And the uh, last question is, what one question would you like to ask me? What well, one question I want to ask you? Um, what have you learned doing your show that changed your life? It's a really good one. I haven't been asked that one before in 200 episodes. Um, it changed my life. Um, that... Every one of every interview I do, no matter 
how successful the person is, there is, they're just people. And I don't care if I've interviewed a guy that is a billionaire or somebody that is, you know, struggling to, to make ends meet. They are just people that are on the same path that we're all on and they're trying to figure out their own shit too. And so it has demystified this illusion of, oh my God, you're on television or, oh my God, you're, you know, you're captain of industry. And when I get to talk to them and I cover not just the area of expertise that they have, because they're usually very strong in that area, very confident in that area, and, and frankly can be very intimidating. But when I cover other areas of their life, I can see the chinks in the armor and I can see where their struggles are and it humanizes them because we're, we're usually have this bright spotlight of, Oh my God, he's an MD or, Oh my God, he's a, but we don't see that they're, you know, that they once collected comic books. (laughs) You know what I mean? And so I think there's not one answer to that question, but it's a general answer that we're all just trying to figure this fucking shit out ourselves. Like it's not, you know, it, like we're, we're all in our own way struggling and we're all good at something, but we're all, we all have challenges and it's, um, it, it's created, it's leveled the playing field. Does that, does that answer make sense? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Doc, uh, listen, this has been fantastic. We're going to link up uh, in the show notes everything we've talked about and how people can get a hold of you um, and sign up for uh, for one of your treatments, because I, I think uh, I think we all need it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me on the show. You got it, brother.